Good evening. Uh, welcome to Bio 1022. I'm Ian Coates. This is week eight. And here is respiratory system. This one here is a great one. Uh, everything there that we learn from blood and cardiovascular, we need to know that before we can get into the respiratory system. This is a great one. Here we deal with the anatomy, physiology, uh, breathing, as well as the diseases that are involved. This is a good one. Emphysema, asthma. We'll get into all these COPD. This is a good one. So if you guys have any questions, please email me at ian.coats at georgiancollege.ca. As well, please don't forget about the textbook. Pause, start, stop this video as you like. Go back and rewind. Please hit all the videos and embedded features that are in it. Other than that, I think we're good to go. Let's rock and roll, shall we? As adults, boy, I just ran up the stairs here. I think I'm breathing more than that. <sighs> but um, as adults there, the breathing rate tends to be around uh, 12 to 20 uh, breaths per minute. Okay. And uh, just uh, some words here just to get us through the next slide there. There'll be some more in this and that. So, But respiration occurs at a macroscopic level at the organ system. Uh, but there's also... A microscopic as well. Gas exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide occur at the cellular and molecular levels. And you're going to see here that there's external respiration, internal respiration. What exactly does all this mean? We'll get there, all right? Uh, aerobic, you know what that means. Aerobic reactions of cellular respiration allow for ATP production, carbon dioxide generation forming carbonic acid interesting what the body does with carbon dioxide which is a garbage product there's no use for it it's all you know when when uh, I supply my big toe with sugar and if I supply my big toe with oxygen my big toe will start to be will be able to produce energy right and in that process one of the byproducts the junk garbage products is carbon dioxide co2 and it's a junk product. It's on its way from my big toe to the lungs to get out of here. But the body is such a marvel of technology that it utilizes a junk product that's on its way out. It uses it one last time. And uh, you'll, you'll see it changes uh, carbon dioxide into bicarbonate ion, which the body uses at a, as a blood buffer. You should know what a buffer is by at this point in time. If not, by the end of today's class, you will. Let's get on with things, shall we? Overview of the respiratory system functions. Takes in oxygen, removes carbon dioxide. Yes, yes, yes. Regulates blood pH by removing carbon dioxide. Mm hmm, interesting. Warms and moistens the inhaled air because the worst thing you could do is breathe in cold, dry air. Uh, you go, you tell you, if you have a horse, you take a horse for a run on a cold, dry morning, there's a possibility there that you could kill them, all right? Warm's got, the air's got to be warm and wet, which is also good for bugs, bacteria as well. That's why they love your lungs and my lungs too. Uh, filters particles from the inhaled air. That's why we have nose hairs, right? Uh, Give sense of smell as well as a sense of taste, because if you ever tried to plug your nose, good luck trying to taste anything. Uh, produces sound by moving air past the vocal cords. Um, just a little note there that every breath you breathe in, in and around half a million bacteria also come in with that breath. So you're going to notice here that there's going to be a lot of mucus around this lecture. And mucus you know, it's not the uh, not the most lo loveliest of things here, but it's one of our first lines of defenses, as you remember there from week three, okay? Uh, when we talk about first, second, and third lines of defenses. Mucus saved our life millions of times. Uh, respiration here involves both the respiratory and the circulatory system. Five processes that supply the body with O2 and disposes of the CO2. There is, and these are just definitions, you'll uh, see them later on for sure. Ventilation, 
movement of air into and out of our lungs. So think of this as macro, okay? Um, inspiration, breathing in, also known as inhalation. Expiration, also known as exhalation, breathing out. Here we're talking about the lungs, macro. Uh, respiration, gas exchange. Hmm, where is that happening? Aha, uh -huh, alveoli. Ooh. Cellular respiration, use of oxygen by cells to make ATP. Now, where is that happening? Uh, the next slide here, putting a little bit of these into context. Here we've got the respiratory system, but you'll see that it overlaps with the circulatory system for sure. Pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary, you should be on that one. This is breathing. This is the act of moving air in and out of the lungs. External respiration. O2 and CO2 exchange between the lungs and the blood. Alveoli should be in there somewhere. Transport. Oxygen and CO2 in the blood. Okay, that's pure circulatory system. Internal respiration as opposed to external. Internal, this is the exchange of O2 and CO2 between the blood and the tissues and the cells. Okay, so this is the exchange of the gases between the lungs and the blood. This is the exchange of the gases there between the blood and the tissue. Okay, internal, external. Cellular respiration. So you see that there's three kinds of respiration. And cellular respir uh, respiration, ATP and CO2 production. Okay, utilizing the oxygen to make ATP and in the process a byproduct that's junk is CO2. All right. Anatomy of the respiratory system. Okay. You have the upper respiratory tract as opposed to the lower respiratory tract, upper nose, nasal cavity, sinuses, pharynx. And you'll see the pharynx is three parts. There's your uh, nasal, um, laryngo, and oral. We'll get into those there. The lower respiratory tract, there you have the larynx. Okay, there's your voice box, trachea, bronchial tree. You can see them here. And then you've got your lungs for sure. The functions of the respiratory system include, uh, or sorry, the structures there, nose, nasal cavity, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli. Whereas these can be divided in the upper and lower respiratory tracts, which we've already seen. The respiratory zone, the site of gas exchange. Microscopic structures, respiratory bronchioles, alveoli, ducts, and alveoli. The conducting zone, this is the conduit to gas exchange site, so all the respiratory structures. Respiratory muscles, oh, we didn't even mention the diaphragm yet. We'll get there for sure. And all other muscles that promote ventilation. The nose, you can see here, these are called the nasal conche. Okay, you've got a superior, middle, and inferior it's all just about adding surface area. The more surface area available, the more we can warm this air and clean it up because there's lots of hairs all in here, okay? Provides an airway for respiration, moistens and warms the air, filters and cleans the air, serves as a resonating chamber for speech. La exactly. Houses uh, the olfactory receptors there for smelling, okay? The nasal cavity, okay, you'll see here the little caricature, there's lots of mucus, okay. There's cilia, goblet cells, goblet cells, what do they make? Hmm. Hmm. Respiratory mucosa, mucus and serous secretions contain lysozyme. You guys have seen that one there before, our body's natural antibiotic and some defensins there. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium with cilia and goblet cells. There's your mucus, okay, goblet cells. And the, you're going to see a major uh, theme of the respiratory tract is, as I said, you breathe in half a million bacteria with every single breath. And you'll see that your lungs are, you know, all that whole area is lined with uh, mucus. And those half a million bacteria that get in there every breath, they instantly get trapped into the mucus. 
That's the whole point. And then you see these cilia, okay? These are kind of like, um, I don't know, um, seaweed at the bottom of the ocean. You know, it's kind of swaying back and forth with the ocean, right? And that's what these guys here, they're swaying back and forth and they're pushing that mucus up and up and up eventually to the point where that's the whole point. Get that mucus out, right? Uh, smokers will tend to not have cilia. They'll all be burned off there in the lungs. And that's a big problem because if you can't move that mucus, then it just sits there and those bugs will sit there. And if you're smoking still, that uh, tar and that smoke will just go in there in your lungs and sit there. Sit there for years and that's where the cancer starts. So just be careful. Uh, cilia moves the contaminated mucus posteriorly, posteriorly to the throat. Inspired air is worn by plexuses of capillaries and veins. Absolutely, sensory nerve endings trigger sneezing. So, here is the pharynx, and the pharynx is this whole area here. And you have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx there. And the, uh, the nasopharynx, okay, the uh, air passageway posterior to the nasal cavity, okay, Lining pseudostratified columnar epithelium, soft palate, and uvula closed the nasopharynx during swallowing. And that's the whole point, right, is when you swallow, you, do, you want food to go down. And the part of the nasopharynx there, it closes off so food can't get up. Now, can food get up? Absolutely. But generally, it doesn't. Okay. The oropharynx there is passageway there for food. Okay, and air there from the level of the soft palate to the epiglottis, uh, lining of stratified squamous epithelium, uh, palatine tonsil in the lateral walls of the, uh, the fossies there, lingual tongue on the posterior surface of the tongue. The bottom here, you have the laryngopharynx passageway for food and air posterior to the upright epiglottis, extends to the larynx where it also continues with the esophagus. And you see this is the place where the trachea comes and then there's your esophagus right there, and your epiglottis fits over. So when you swallow a piece of food, this epiglottis here folds down and covers the trachea, so the food just goes down the esophagus. But other than that, it's always open, so when you breathe, the air just goes in here. Okay. The larynx there, the voice box, is an enlargement in the airway superior to the trachea and inferior to the pharynx made of hyaline cartilage, okay, is composed of a framework of muscles and cartilage bound by elastic tissue. Your epiglottis, elastic cartilage, covers the opening to the larynx so the food does not enter the lower respiratory tract, okay. There's your hyoid bone, okay, sesamoid bone. It's embedded in a tendon. It has no articulation with any other bone, okay. Thyroid cartilage there with the laryngeal prominence, the Adam's apple, okay, ring-shaped Cricoid cartilage there. Just some inside shots there of the larynx. Um, the uh, voice box uh, fold may act as a sphincter there to prevent air passage. Um, Valsalva maneuver. That's a very interesting one there. The whole idea of putting your face there to cold water. You should Google that one. That's a beauty. Also in your textbook. Glottis closes to prevent exhalation, abdominal muscles contract, intra-abdominal pressures rise, helps to empty uh, the rectum or stabilize the trunk during heavy lifting. Okay, uh, contains elastic fibers there, and as the air uh, runs over the vocal cords there, it cre uh, creates a vibration and gives us our distinctive and beautiful voices. The trachea. I know this is kind of like the bronchial tree in the lungs here, but the trachea is right here, okay? And uh, it's about two and a half centimeters in diameter, about 12 centimeters in length, okay? It has these uh, C-shaped uh, uh, cartilage rings. And you have to think there, when you're talking about, uh, just going back to this shot here, the whole idea when you have the esophagus and the airway, the airway is completely covered with cartilage. It has... It's maintained this opening. The esophagus doesn't. It kind of looks like a breakfast sausage. It opens as wide as the food is, and then it closes back to its original shape. 
but not so with the trachea. It's held open. Why? Because air is more important than food, and that's why these guys. That's why the trachea has these uh, cartilaginous rings to help it maintain uh, open. It's there to protect. Mucus also protects the lungs from infectious agents. Uh, okay, by catching them, the cilia are continually moving them back up towards the nose, uh, the nose and mouth there to uh, to throw them out. Smoking destroys the cilia, so coughing is the only way to keep mucus from accumulating within the lungs. Okay. The bronchial tree consists of these branched airways leading from the trachea to the alveoli. So you'll see that you'll have a primary bronchi, secondary, um, like you have your right primary bronchi, you will have your left primary bronchi, so you have your secondary bronchus, tertiary, and then you'll have terminal bronchi. And they get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually there you get, at the, at the very end, you get these grape-like structures called alveoli. And these guys here, they're all about surface area. The more surface area you have, the more contact there to get oxygen into the blood. Because these alveoli are completely covered in capillaries. And you remember that capillaries are the only place in the body where, that's right, exchange happens. Okay, so these guys here are covered in capillaries and for the oxygen there to go into the blood and the CO2 to come out and then out your, uh, what you blow out. Okay, so just some good shots there. It's the alveoli that provides surface area for gas exchange. And, you know, um, this is the great thing about the body. It makes surface area where there is none. And if you flatten out the entire surface area of your lungs, you'll have about the area of a tennis court. So there is lots of room there to breathe, okay? Um, branches of the bronchial tree, you'll see there you have your right and left primary bronchies, your secondary uh, bronchi tertiary, you have your intralobar, and for the most part, I think um, the, uh, the bronchies here, you'll notice there that the lung has the, uh, that trochlear notch there for the heart, the left lung is smaller than the right lung, but you have the bronchies there that are covered in, it may, continues there with these uh, cartilage. It's all about protecting these bronchies, okay? Um, as well, note the lobes of the lung. One, two, and three. One, and two. Conducting and respiratory zones here. Okay, just wanted to show you here. These are the divisions of the branches from the trachea to the alveoli. Okay, just segments it down. One, two, three, four. Moving on down into five and six. Now we're kind of almost getting into the microscopic here. There's your trachea. There's your bronchies, bronchioles, terminal bronchies. And then we get down to the end. We get the alveolar ducts and the alveolar sacs. Um, these guys here, it's all about surface area, okay? There's your alveolar pores, and they're just like little grape-like structures, and they work like a charm. These alveoli are uh, the, uh, these are the, these are the places there and the site for gas exchange, okay? Uh, most of the air-facing surface of the walls are lined by this continuous layer, one cell thick of simple squamous epithelium, Okay, and these guys here are called type 1 alveolar cells. Blood and capillaries is only separated from air and alveoli by, by, by about 0.2 micrometers. Okay, so as I said there, the capillaries are covering these alveoli because it's all about gas exchange. The cells cover 90% of the alveolar surface. It is these cells in which gas exchange with the blood occurs. Type 1 alveoli cells. There are type 2. These are a little different. They are not involved in gas exchange. These guys here are involved in producing a substance, a slippery substance called surfactant. Okay, It's a little soapy, and all it does is it keeps the lungs sliding against each other. 
okay? And um, we'll get into the whole reason of what breathing is, but the the uh, what this surfactant does is is we'll uh, I'll show you there in a bit, but basically the analogy there, if you have a piece of saran wrap, flat, you know, you flatten out a piece of flat plastic saran wrap, plastic wrap, and then you put a couple drops of water on that, and then you put another piece of plastic wrap on top of that and flatten it out so there's no air bubbles in between. So basically you have two pieces of plastic wrap that are completely attached because of those water droplets. You'll never ever be able to break them apart. It's suction, right? You've created a negative pressure and that they are together forever. Well, that's what's kind of going on with the lungs. When you, ex when you breathe in, your muscles there of your chest are expanding. They're pulling your rib cage out. Well, how do your lungs go with your rib cage? They're not really attached. They're just sitting in your, you know, chest, but they're not attached. But because of this surfactant, the uh, the inside of the chest wall expands and goes out because your muscles are pulling your chest cavity out. But because it's attached with this surfactant, it creates this. Um, uh, it's, it's completely stuck together, okay? And that's how the lungs move. They move with the chest cavity, okay? Through this suction, because one membrane is completely um, uh, put onto another membrane and it has this surfactant in the middle, and so the lungs have no choice but to go with the rib cage. And when the rib cage, um, and when you breathe out and your rib cage gets smaller, your lungs do the same thing as well. So that's type 2 alveolar cells. They produce surfactant, which is similar to mucus. It's a detergent-like lipid protein complex, decreases the friction and surface tension of the alveoli. Total surface area of alveoli is very large, somewhere in and around uh, tennis court. Okay. Here's just some more shots of the alveoli, and you'll see that the alveoli are completely covered in capillaries. No doubt about it. And you'll see where the, where is this coming from? It's coming from the heart, right? It's coming from the pulmonary artery, which then drops off the CO2, picks up the oxygen there, and now it's back to the pulmonary vein, back to the left atrium. Okay, and there's your alveoli, beautiful, beautiful science. Um, this is an actual uh, electron micrograph there, and you'll see that there's your alveoli completely covered in capillaries, okay? This is where the oxygen exchange is happening. This is what goes on there if you smoke. Look what happens to those alveoli. They just turn into paper. And no, do uh, no joke, this happens the same to the arteries, they turn into paper. You remember uh, last week there when we were talking about the cardiovascular system and the arteries, like the uh, aorta and all those big arteries, man, they take a hit every single heartbeat. But because they're so strong and muscular and elastic, they can take the hit. But if you smoke, this is what happens. It kind of looks like, uh, like a wasp's paper uh, nest. You know, it uh, doesn't look very strong at all. So don't smoke. The detailed anatomy of the respiratory membrane, just kind of the same shot there. You're going to see type 1 and type 2, okay? Just remember there that these guys here are simple squamous epithelium, okay? And the whole idea there that the oxygen comes into your lungs and then jumps to your blood because the oxygen concentration in the air is about 21%. The oxygen concentration by the time it comes back to your lungs is probably about 0.3%. So the oxygen from the air just jumps into your blood. The CO2 that's coming back to the lungs is, uh, is a higher percentage than the CO2 in the air. So the CO2 in the lungs just are in the blood, jumps right out of your, uh, the blood into your lungs and into the air. It's all from diffusion, okay? Uh, the lungs there occupy all of the thoracic cavity except the mediastinum, the root there, the site of vascular and bronchial attachments, costal surface, anterior, lateral, and posterior surfaces for sure. 
Here is your dia diaphragm, and in a resting position, it is in a bell shaped. But <clears throat> when you take a breath, it drops down, right? And then <sighs> that's how the diaphragm works. And when the diaphragm drops down, basically the whole lung space, if you look here, this is your lung space right here. In a relaxed, you just breathed out. But if you breathe in, the diaphragm drops. Look at the size of your chest cavity now. You've created a negative pressure, a vacuum. So therefore now the lungs, they blow up. Okay? Not blow up, but get bigger. All right? And air rushes in. Like, take a big breath of air. I just did that. My diaphragm dropped. Air rushed in and it actually felt like I was sucking air in my trachea, but I'm not. I just created a negative pressure. My chest is bigger, so my lungs expanded. And in that expansion, you got to fill that expanse with something. You can't have a vacuum that only exists in space. So if I expand this chest cavity, those lungs expand too. You got to have the air and the air rushes in even though it feels like I'm sucking it in okay um, some lung tissue now if you see something like this navigate yourself there's no anterior posterior so where am I looking at here have a look try and figure out something aha there's the spinal cord there so this has got to be the posterior this is anterior oh that's got to be my heart there's my two lungs there very good. Okay, so I got my bearings now. And uh, the um, you'll see here that I'll just zoom in. We uh, you saw these words there before. The you've got uh, pleura. Now pleura is just a membrane. That's all it is. You remember that saran wrap I was talking about? Well, you'll see here you have your parietal pleura, which is on the outside of the basically the inside wall of the chest cavity. And then you have your visceral pleura, which is on the uh, on the organ side of the cavity, right? It's on the organ. You know, in this case there, the lung. So your parietal pleura is on the uh, cavity wall. So there is this space, okay? And this is where the surfactant hangs out. And you see that this pleura is basically attached to this pleura, even though they're not attached. They're attached by this surfactant, that soapy substance there that, you know, I was saying if you put a little bit of drops of water on a piece of saran wrap and flatten it all out and then put another piece of saran wrap on top of there, basically you've got a suction. And there's no way that you would ever be able to pull those two pieces of saran wrap apart. You'd rip it before... Uh, you were able to pull them apart. And that's what's going on here, is that when the chest cavity expands, okay, this parietal pleura, because it's suctioned there to the visceral pleura due to surfactant, it pulls the lungs with it. And in that way, the lungs expand. That's what's going on. Visceral pleura, parietal pleura, okay? Um, yeah, that's what we're talking about there. This space between the two pleural membranes is uh, very small. It's called the pleural cavity or the pleural space, which is filled with the surfactant that prevents friction from breathing because everything is moving in there. you got to oil everything up, okay? Inspiration. You guys have heard of Boyle's Law. That's what we're dealing with here, right? A decrease in pressure is equal to an increase in volume. Okay? An increase in pressure is equal to a decrease in volume. And if you think about that, um, if you have a balloon, and if you increase the pressure on the balloon, you're squeezing it, you increase the pressure, you're decreasing the volume. And look what's going on here as far as uh, a needle plunger. Oh, there we go. So... Here, what am I doing? All right. 
I am decreasing the volume. I'm pushing on the plunger. So I'm decreasing the volume. So therefore, I must be increasing the pressure. So the pressure here is higher than it is outside. So the air is going to run out. Here, what am I doing to my volume? I'm pulling back on the plunger. I'm increasing my volume. So therefore, I must be decreasing my pressure. The pressure in here is less than it is outside. So the air rushes in. This is how the lungs work. That's it. Okay. You breathe in. And then breathe out. That's the whole thing. Okay. Um, atmospheric pressure due to the weight of the air is, uh, is the force that moves the air into the lungs. At sea level, atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. You guys will know this there. 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere is equal to 101.3 kPa. Okay, those are all standards there. You've used them there in chemistry. Uh, moving the plunger of a syringe causes the air to move in and out. That's exactly what's going on there for the lungs. Beauty. Okay. Boyle's law, I've already referenced it. You're good to go on that one, right? If you uh, decrease the volume, you're increasing the pressure. And here, if you increase the volume, you are decreasing the pressure. And Boyle's law is what we call the inverse law. If you increase one, you have decreased the other. Okay. Major events and inspiration. Um, the nerve impulse travels on the phrenic nerve to the muscle fibers in the diaphragm and contracting them. Like, that's the thing with breathing. We do have control over our breathing. You can stop breathing anytime. Take a breath, just like my 10-year-old daughter, and she can hold her breath and go and read in the bathroom until she gets her, uh, what you, <gasps> that's it, Dad, I'm not talking to you anymore, right? And But eventually, you can hold your breath for as long as you want, but then your body will kick in and will start taking uh, autonomic control over it. Uh, as the dome-shaped diaphragm moves downward, the thoracic cavity expands. At the same time, the external intercostal muscles may contract, raising the ribs and expanding the thoracic cavity further. There you go. Okay. The intraalveolar pressure decreases. Atmospheric pressure greater on the outside. Okay. And the air rushes in. Exactly the same as the, this is a great little analogy right here. If you can uh, apply this there to how lungs work, that is great. Okay. Uh, major events in expiration, there the diaphragm and external respiratory muscles relax, okay, returns back to a bell shape there, the elastic tissues of the lungs and thoracic cage stretch during inspiration, suddenly recoil, and surface tension collapses the alveoli walls, uh, tissues recoiling around the lungs increase the alveo intraalveolar pressure and air is squeezed out of the lungs, okay, there's your internal intercostals there. Good. Pulmonary ventilation is defined as the exchange of air between the atmosphere and the alveoli. Okay, this is what's going on there in the lungs. How does this relate to the lungs? A volume change would lead to a pressure change. That pressure change leads to the flow of gases to equalize the pressure. Air always flows towards the lower pressure. Since atmospheric pressure is fairly constant, this means airflow depends on the pressure inside of our lungs only. So that's why our lungs will never, ever, ever be atmospheric pressure. That would be pretty traumatic. If our, if our lungs were the same pressure as the outside, we'd have collapsed lungs. I'll get more into that there. It's called a pneumothorax. The respiratory alveolar pressure is always relative to the atmospheric pressure. We measure this in millimeters of mercury or atmospheres or in kilopascals, depending upon what you're using. Um, yeah. The, uh, at sea level, this is 760 millimeters of mercury. Anywhere else, this in the States there, uh, it's 760 millimeters of mercury. Scientists would use atmospheres. Here in Canada, we would use kilopascals. If you were to go to higher pressure up into the Andes Mountains, the pressure would be lower. How would that affect your breathing? 
if you entered an area of lower pressure. Interesting. During inhalation, what happens? Your lungs expand, increasing the volume of your lungs. This increase in volume causes a decrease in pressure. Think Boyle's Law. Increase in volume, decrease in pressure. Since air always flows towards lower pressure, the air will enter the lungs. During exhalation, the exact opposite happens. The lung volume decreases, so therefore the pressure must be increasing, causes airflow to move out. Pulmonary, uh, pulmonary ventilation, that intrapleural space surrounding the lungs also fluctuates with breathing, but it is always four millimeters of mercury less than the alveolar pressure. If the intrapleural pressure were equal to the alveolar pressure, there would be no force holding the alveoli open and the lungs would collapse. And this is what we call a pneumothorax. And it reminds me there of, um, I don't know, millions of years ago when I was a kid, uh, I read about a guy there who was, I think he was on an ATV or a bike or a motorcycle and he fell off with considerable speed and landed on a white picket fence. And I guess one of these pickets went right through the guy's chest and um, yeah, punctured his lung, punctured everything, but I guess he didn't take it out and walked himself there to the hospital and uh, where they were able to take it out. And as far as I know, the guy is still alive. But yeah, if you had pulled that uh, fence post out of the guy's chest, his lung would be at the same pressure as the outside air and the lungs would collapse and therefore now they wouldn't be able to move air around. And you can see here by this next slide that if you just kind of walk through it here, the, you'll see that your lungs are always a little off. Okay. Now you want to go to, uh, let's go to rest. This is where the, um, the pressure of the atmosphere, one atmosphere is 760 mill millimeters of mercury. The interpleural space there, the pressure of the interpleural, okay, is about 0.994 atmospheres, about four millimeters of mercury off. You see that? And the pressure of the alveoli should be about the same, okay, as your air pressure. Now, if you're, uh, let's say you're breathing in, so your diaphragm is going down. So you should have a negative pressure or a lower pressure in your lungs than you do outside because the air is going to rush in. So the atmospheric pressure doesn't change. One atmosphere. You'll see there that the interpleural pressure is about point. Uh, let's go with uh, millimeters of mercury. It's about 760. It's about 754 there for the pressure in the interpleural space. And then you got the pressure of the alveoli, which is a little less. All right, and you'll see there that these are less, so the air will rush into the lungs. That's breathing in. So now, if we're going to be breathing out, this should be a little higher, and you'll see there that it is. The pressure in the alveoli when you're breathing out is just above 760 millimeters, 763 millimeters of mercury, which is greater than atmospheric. So therefore, it's strong enough there to push that air out. And that's where your lungs are. They're just off of atmospheric pressure. A little below, a little above. And that's how we're able to move oxygen around. Okay. Great little movie here. This just details all the different aspects of uh, breathing. You guys have been sitting here this whole time and you've been breathing and you haven't even realized it, right? And that kind of breathing there, we call it tidal volume. All right, but there's different evolutionary aspects to the lungs. There's your, to you know, your total lung capacity. There's your inspiratory reserve, inspiratory capacity. You have your vital capacity. That's your living air. You have residual air. Like just the, uh, the whole thing there is that, I want you to take the biggest breath that you can, and then when you're done, you can actually take a little bit more. And uh, if you take in the biggest breath, and then you can always take in a little bit more. Okay? And the works the, the opposite. If you blow out all of the air out of your lungs, you'll be able to blow out a little bit more after. 
And uh, yeah, it, it's an amazing piece. I'll definitely get you on title volume for sure, but watch the movie. It's a lot of fun. Physical factors influencing pulmonary ventilation. Uh, we've got airway resistance, alveolar surface tension, and lung compliance. Okay. And uh, we look at these there, airway resistance. Friction is the major non-elastic source of resistance to gas flow. The relationship between flow, pressure, and resistance is this. I'm not going to ask you this. Um, oh, I could ask you what the formula is, but I'm not going to ask you for any numbers, I don't think. The change in pressure is the pressure gradient between the atmosphere and the alveoli. Two millimeters of mercury or less during normal quiet breathing. Gas flow changes inversely with resistance. Increase in resistance, a lowering of gas flow. Makes sense, right? And to continue this thought there, the wrist is, resistance is usually insignificant because of large airway diameter in the first part of the conducting zone. Those bronchies, they got some good surface area. They're pretty big, so that's all right. There shouldn't be too much trouble getting air down the pipe. Progressively small uh, branching of the airways as they get smaller, though, increases the total cross-sectional area. Uh, resistance disappears at the terminal bronchies where the diffusion drives the gas movement. Okay, and you'll see here, resistance increases, but then as the number of uh, terminals expands and we get more surface area, the resistance pretty much drops down. Okay. The elastic recoil, lungs and balloons want to return to their unstretched shape. Results of arrangements of fibers. So you see the elastic tissue is stretched. The elastic tissue recoils to an unstretched position. Either are okay. It can exist in both states. Okay. Surface tension though. Water has a high surface tension, attraction between polar molecules, okay? And surfactant from alveolar cells will decrease this surface tension. And if you have a look here, the surface tension between water molecules makes alveoli want to collapse because they're pulling at each other, right? Water has a huge attractive force to it, and it's actually trying to pull those alveoli down. But as long as we add a little bit of soap in there, those water molecules relax, and this guy here can just go to any shape there that it wants, and that's what we want it to. Uh, measure of elastic recoil, when the compliance decreases, lungs are more difficult to inflate. You get something there called pulmonary edema, backing up, backing up of fluid in the lungs, respiratory distress syndrome, pulmonary fibrosis. If the lungs are too stretchy though, you can't expel air on exhalation, possible barrel chest. This is what happens there if you smoke for a long time and your lungs have trouble trying to get rid of the air that's in them. What they'll do is you'll take a, an extra big breath, you know, every day for the rest of your life. And that means there that your lungs have to stretch, your chest has to stretch, and eventually it permanently stretches to the point where you have a barrel chest, okay? It's not the breathing in that becomes the trouble, it's the breathing out that becomes the trouble. Uh, diminished there by non-elastic scar tissue, fibrosis, reduced production of surfactant, decreased flexibility of the thoracic cage. Okay. Dead space. Some inspired air never contributes to gas exchange. Anatomically dead space, volume of the conducting zone, conduits around 150 milliliters of the lungs. Alveolar dead space, uh, this is where the alveoli that cease to act in gas exchange due to collapse or obstruction. Uh, total dead space is the sum of the above non-useful volumes. So that is your dead space. All right. The sum of partial pressures of gases in the air, uh, gases will add up to one atmosphere or 760 milliliters of mercury. So the composition of the gases in our air. Nitrogen is about 78%, oxygen there is about 21%, argon about 1, carbon dioxide 0 0.03, ozone 0 0.01, other gases, and they, you see they all add up to be 100%. 
Well, we can do that. We can relate that there according to their, um, their partial pressures. And uh, if you sum up all the air, it, as we know, at uh, sea level, the uh, air pressure there is 760 milliliters of mercury. Well, if you multiply 0 0.78 times 760, you get that number. So therefore, the, this gas in the air, all the nitrogen in the air, because it's constituting 78% of all air, it's producing 78% of all the pressure, 593.4 millimeters of mercury. Oxygen is producing tw is 25% by mass, so it'll have 21% of the pressure, and so on and so forth. And this will also add up to be 760, okay, as this added up to be 100. Okay, partial pressures, we'll get there. According to the diagram, what would the percent composition of the red atom and its partial pressure if the container's pressure is one atmosphere and 760 milliliters of mercury? Well, you have a look here, how many atoms are in here? One, two, three, four, five atoms. This is 20% of all the atoms in here, so this is 20% of 760.2 atmosphere, so that would be 152 millimeters of mercury. If that doesn't make sense, get a hold of me. Five atoms, this is 20% of all the atoms, so that will be 0.2. Now, millimeters of mercury, 0.2 or 20% of 760 gives you 152 millimeters of mercury that that guy right there is exerting on everything else. Dalton's law of partial pressure, where the pressure total is equal to the pressure of 1 plus the pressure of 2 plus the pressure of 3, which is exactly what we've just done. The pressure of 1 plus the pressure of 2 plus the pressure of 3 plus the pressure of 4, 5, and 6 will add up to the total pressure. So these are partial pressures of a total gas. That's what we've done. That's all we're talking about here. Gas molecules undergo continuous random motion. Gas molecules collide with each other. The closer together, the more pressure. That makes sense, right? The closer together they are, the more pressure they're going to exert, okay? Anything that increases movement will increase pressure. For example, temperature. If you increase the temperature, that will also increase the pressure. Dalton's law, in a mixture of gases, the pressure exerted by each gas is independent of all the other gases. So this guy here, I'm just going to put this right over here. This guy here, and have a look. Now, if you, um, if all the pressure here that's going on is because of all the molecules in here. These are the ones that are adding the pressure. So if I heat this up, if I put a fire under here, these things are going to be bebop and scatting 10 times as fast. So the pressure is going to increase ferociously. If I cool this down, these guys are going to slow right down and therefore the pressure will decrease. Okay. Uh, but they flow independent of each other. Even though this could be one, you know, this could be um, an oxygen atom, this could be uh, I don't know, chlorine atom, whatever. They are independent of each other. Even though they're in the same container, one has nothing to do with the other. Oxygen will flow to the lowest pressure of oxygen molecules. Other gases like carbon dioxide will have no effect on its flow. Carbon dioxide will flow to the lowest pressure of carbon dioxide molecules. Even if there is a high concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood, oxygen can still flow from the lungs to the blood. The oxygen moving from the blood to the lungs or lungs to the blood has nothing to do with the carbon dioxide moving from the blood to the lungs or the lungs to the blood. Okay? Nothing to do with each other. Uh, partial pressure here. Okay, this means there that the 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure oxygen makes up about 160 milliliters. Okay, um, so as we said, that's all right here. Okay, oxygen, okay, 158. 
That's what we're talking about here. Can you fill in these ones here? Partial pressures. Let's get them from here. Um, gas exchange and transport. This is Henry's law. When a liquid blood is exposed to air containing a gas, oxygen, molecules of gas will dissolve into the liquid. Makes sense. Henry's law states that the partial pressure of oxygen and air, 21%, is proportional to the amount of dissolved the amount of dissolved oxygen in the blood. If we breathe a higher concentration of oxygen, more will dissolve into the blood. The reverse is also true. CO2 will diffuse out of the blood into a gas phase if the partial pressure is higher in the blood. Diffusion is moving molecules from higher to lower concentration. So this is all just about if you've got oxygen in the blood, you're not going to be able to absorb as much. If you've got a higher concentration of oxygen in the air, that will push more oxygen into the blood and vice versa coming out as well. And you just have a look here that this is what's going on. The um, Here's your lungs, okay? Here's your heart, your cardiovascular system, right? And this is your systemic system, and this will be your pulmonary system, right? And the, uh, the blood comes in the right atrium down the right ventricle, and then it goes out the pulmonary artery towards the lungs where it drops off its uh, carbon dioxide, picks up its oxygen, and you see it turns ruby red to oxyhemoglobin right here. Okay, and the uh, CO2 jumps here, free. The oxygen jumps here, free. Returns back to the body, uh, returns back to the heart via the pulmonary vein, and then into the left atrium, left ventricle, and then out the aorta, and away we go. And then to deliver the uh, oxygen there to the cells. The oxygen level here is greater than the oxygen level here, through simple diffusion, jumps. The carbon dioxide level here is greater than the carbon dioxide level here, so the CO2 jumps. Okay, and uh, you look at uh, gas exchange and diffusion there within the lungs, it's uh, what we were saying there that, you see this is the this is the pulmonary circuit there of the heart and the deoxygenated blood is coming up and you'll see there that the pressure of oxygen in the blood should be pretty low because this is, you know, uh, um, there's not a lot of oxygen in the uh, blood from this stage. And you'll see there that the pressure of CO2 in the blood is 45. And then as it comes there, you see what's going on in the alveoli. The pressure of the oxygen in the alveoli is 104. The pressure of the carbon dioxide in the alveoli in our air is only 40. So you see what's going on. Let's look at the oxygen. The pressure of the oxygen in the air is 104. Pressure of the oxygen in the blood coming around to the, to the alveoli is only 40. So the oxygen jumps. Just jumps easy peasy. And then the carbon dioxide in the blood here is 45. It's relatively high. It's higher than the CO2 that's in the air. So the CO2 readily jumps easy peasy, okay? Welcome to simple diffusion. That's how the lungs work. And here we're talking uh, here at my big toe in the systemic system. The oxygen coming around uh, is uh, relatively high. It's about 95. The CO2 in the blood here is about 40. And then you'll see there that in the interstitial fluid there, the tissue fluid, the, P, uh, the pressure of the oxygen is about 40. Pressure of the CO2 is about 45. So you're thinking there that, hmm, the CO2 is for this is 45, so this, the CO2 is going to jump. The oxygen is going to jump. And look at the partial pressure of oxygen and CO2 within the cells, 20 and 46. So this is higher than that. So the CO2 is readily going to jump. Um, the, and then the uh, oxygen is here at 95. It's going to jump there to 20. So the oxygen is going to jump right in as well. So it's all just about bigger numbers. Uh, diffusion, diffusion, diffusion. They're giving the same numbers here, just showing you the same thing. How the oxygen jumps okay from the alveoli into onto the capillary and vice versa 
okay that's how it works there's no it does it's free money we don't even need to there's no ATP involved because as long as the oxygen concentrations are higher where they need to be the oxygen will just flow and as uh, the CO2 concentrations if they're higher on the inside than the outside the CO2 will just jump into our lungs and we blow it out gas exchange and transport uh, CO2 transport. So where is carbon dioxide located in our body? 10% is dissolved in the plasma, 25% in the hemoglobin. This one here though, the, uh, the CO2 that's produced in my big toe, it's a garbage product and it's on its way out. But what the body does is by the use of this enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, this is an enzyme found in the erythrocytes that increases the chemical conversion of carbon dioxide into bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is HCO3 minus. And what this is, this is your blood buffer. Okay, this is a buffer. A buffer is, is uh, any chemical there that will resist pH change. And that's what I mean. The pH of the blood, it doesn't vary much at all at all. It's around 7.3, 7.4, somewhere in there. 7.4, and it doesn't fluctuate. Like, I mean 7.6, that's basic. You're into alkyl dosis. 7.2, now you're into acidosis. Okay, so that is how, it's just amazing. Millions of years of evolution, a junk product that's on its way out, but the body figures, uh, figures out an enzyme that we can chemically convert that into bicarbonate for the sole purpose of being a blood buffer on your way out. Oh, before you leave on your way out, can you do one more thing? Amazing what the body does. Okay. Uh, oxygen transport. All oxygen carried in the blood is bound to the protein hemoglobin in the form of oxyhemoglobin. We've seen that there uh, a couple weeks ago there when we were dealing with blood. Uh, chemical bonds between oxygen and hemoglobin are relatively unstable. Uh, oxyhemoglobin releases O2 into the body cells. About 75% of the oxygen remains bound to hemoglobin in the venous blood, ensuring safe CO2 levels and thereby pH. You remember there, myoglobin. Uh, oxygen has a less affinity for myoglobin. Uh, myoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen, and that's why it's able to hold on to the oxygen, giving it to them there by the blood. Uh, just a little bit of backup here, gas transported in the blood. Y'all can have a look at those. Beautiful stuff. Uh, control of breathing, the nervous, medulla oblongata, inspiratory neurons, expiratory neurons, the pons, pneumotaxic center, apnostic center, chemical control, pressure of CO2, absolutely that's monitored, and acid, okay, major regulators. Chemoreceptors, central nervous system, peripheral carotid bodies, and aortic bodies. They're always monitoring, always monitoring. Neural control of breathing. The medulla oblongata fires rhythmically and stimulates the phrenic and intercostal nerves. This action by the inspiratory neurons is a starting point for respiration. When the inspiratory neurons quiet down, the expiratory neurons fire, initializing exhalation okay very good um, you'll see here emotional responses anxiety fear of fear of flight um, sneezing coughing and yelling this is all the medulla opioids yeah the I don't know if you've noticed or if you're from Barry or not but there's quite a bit of there's an opioid ep epidemic going on and it's pretty basically countrywide North America wide and uh, it's, it's quite dangerous. And uh, please, um, you know anyone there that's on these or having trouble, I understand. If you need any help, let me know. Okay. We have resources available here at the college. Uh, it's uh, just been devastating to our young people. Such a sad situation. Um, opioids such as morphine depress the respiratory function. Alcohol as well. Okay. They're depressants. They're uh, never administered without checking for adequate respiration. The pons control two centers. They affect the rate of respiration. We've got chemoreceptors regulate the rate of uh, respiration. And the primary regulator of respiration, funny enough, 
is the pressure of CO2. You would think that the primary regulator for respiration would be the amount of oxygen, but it ain't. It's carbon dioxide there that the body is monitoring because excess carbon dioxide is a toxin. Uh, the phrenic nerve stimulates, innervates the diaphragm. And that's what's going on there. Okay. Very good. There are several key triggers for breathing as well. Irritation to the airway structure signals a reflex that inhibits breathing. Uh, temperature, increased body temperature leads to increased rate of breathing. You know, when you heat up, you breathe heavier. Medications, general anesthetic, morphine, alcohol will inhibit and slow down. Uh, amphetamines, uh, caffeine, nicotine will stimulate. Uh, blood levels of oxygen, CO2, and pH, breathing rate and depth increases with uh, if oxygen decreases or if carbon dioxide and or hydrogen ions increase. Good stuff. Key triggers are usually detected by receptors such as stretch receptors in smooth muscle of airway prevent overinflation. Deep inhalation will simulate the stretch receptors and inhibit breathing in any further. Peripheral chemoceptors in carotid arteries, arteries to the brain, and the aortic arch. Right in there. They detect low O2 and high pH. Central chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata detect high CO2. So, in the uh, aortic arch there, they're looking for low oxygen, but they're also looking for high CO2, which are completely different bananas, even though they're, they're two sides of the same chemical equation. The amount of CO2 is a toxin. The, low, the amount of oxygen there, that could kill you, but they could both kill you. Okay. Uh, just a nice little bit of backdoor here. Stimulus, receptor, integrating center, effector, and effects. There's your exercise. This is all about regulation of breathing, oxygen used, and our carbon dioxide is produced. Chemoreceptors detect blood oxygen and CO2 levels. Sensory information is sent to the medulla. Medulla signals inspiratory muscles, increased rate and depth of breathing, homeostasis is reached. So you exercise, you go into oxygen jet, this is the process there, what happens. I like it. You may see, you may need that slide a number of times. Non-respiratory air movements results from reflex action. Cough, sneeze, crying, laughing, hiccup, yawn. Why do we cough? To get stuff out. When you are sick, coughing helps get mucus out of the lungs. Irritants, allergic or not, can trigger coughing since your body is trying to get them out. Why do we sneeze? Irritants. This causes the medulla to stimulate a long inhalation with forced expiration. There you go. Voluntary control of breathing originates in the cerebral cortex frontal lobe. Uh, homeostatic imbalances, COPD. All right. And chronic obstructive pulmonary disease refers to emphysema, chronic bronchitis, or a combination of the two. Causes severe difficulties in ventilation and oxygenation of the blood. Emphysema is caused by destruction and collapse of the smaller airways, bronchioles, and loss of the elasticity. Chronic bronchitis, again, this is not acute. This is long-term. is characterized by excessive mucus production in the bronchies and chronic inflammation changes in the small airways. This cause of obstruction is an accumulation of mucus in the airways and thickening of the inflamed airways. And you have a look right here. Okay, this is a healthy alveoli, nice and pink. Look at all the surface area, look at all the healthy walls. It's all about surface area. The more surface, the more ability there to get oxygen exchanged. Look at all the, surf, all the surface area. That wall's gone, that wall's, two walls gone there. How many walls are gone there? All the, now you're probably 30% of your surface area is gone. That means your ability to breathe in oxygen is decreased by 30%. Yeah, it's a tough one. Uh, asthma is a disease characterized by inter intermittent episodes in which airways smooth muscle contract strongly, increasing airway resistance. Okay. Um, 
the basic defect in asthma is chronic inflammation. That's what's going on there. The cause of which varies from person to person, allergies, viral infect uh, infections, uh, environmental factors. The underlying inflammation makes the airway smooth muscle contract strongly in response to such things as exercise, especially in cold, dry air, cigarette smoke, and others. And you'll see that it's kind of like uh, arthrosclerosis there when you're talking blood pressure, right? When the fat accumulates there, like there's a reason why the artery is that big. There's a reason why this bronchial is this big because I need that amount of air going in and out every breath. But if there is inflammation and mucus, now you're in trouble. And that's where you take puffers and those things and steroids there to try and uh, antihistamines to try and uh, reduce the effects of this inflammation. Uh, tuberculosis, this is an infectious disease there caused by the bacterium, mycobacterium tuberculosis. This one here is such a bad bug that if you develop it there, you're looking at about a year of uh, antibiotics. Um, and if you know that uh, x-rays are used to look at hard tissue, bones and teeth only. They don't show, a, no, no soft tissue shows up on an x-ray or it shouldn't. You use CAT scans, ultrasounds, or MRIs there to see soft tissue, but not bone, right? And uh, But after a bout with uh, tuberculosis, they'll make you go and take an x-ray, and uh, goodness sakes forbid, you see these hard nodules in your lungs that what happens there, the bacterium causes these nodules and parts of the lung there to uh, solidify up and to the point where they're actually visible on an x-ray. Huge damage, okay? Symptoms include fevers, night sweats, weight loss, a racking cough, spitting up of blood. Yeah, 12 months of antibiotics. Horrible. Uh, lung cancer, leading cause of cancer death in North America, all due to smoking. Okay, if there's, uh, you know, first-hand smoke, but send second-hand smoke. The three most common types, there's squamous cell carcinoma, about 20 to 40% of all cases, and the bronchial epithelium. Uh, adenocarcinoma, 40% of cases originates there in the peripheral lung areas. And then we've got small cell carcinoma, which is about 20% contains lymphocyte-like cells that originate in the primary bronchi and subsequently metastasize. Okay. Uh, lifespan changes reflect an accumulation of environmental influences and the effect of aging and other organ systems may include the cilia may become less active or you burn them off completely due to smoking mucus thickening, swallowing, gagging, coughing reflex, macrophages in the lungs lose efficiency, an increased susceptibility to res uh, respiratory infections, a barrel chest may develop, bronchial walls thin and collapse, dead space increases, right? And here's just some words there to add to the pile. Anoxia, O2 deficiency where cells don't have, uh, can't get enough oxygen, as opposed to hypoxia, low O2 in the inspired air, asphyxia, low O2, high CO2, feeling of suffocation. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you there for the next term. I think it's digestion. I could be wrong, but I could be right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye.